This episode is brought to you by our patrons, such badasses and travelers of the space-time continuum as Carl King. Sir, I salute you. Wow. Uh, yeah, Ken Pate, thank you so much. Sarah Gallagher, you have our gratitude. Super Taft, thank you. Thank you, Al Meyer. Hey, oh, this Aaron. is perfect. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> she had to say it. <laughs> I didn't have to. I could have been mean. Binti Ali, thank you very much. Thank you, Jenna Troska. Thanks, Maria Luisa Pereira. Nate, I'm sorry. I that was a little weird in the headphones. What? Who did Jay just say? I believe she just said Maria Luisa Pereira. Okay, just want to make sure you yeah, did yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> thank you as well to Mike Matthews. Carolyn Streckman, thank you so much. Lacey Cochran has our thanks. Tim Arnold, a.k.a. Forsworn and Seven Beers Ago, a.k.a. Tenno. Oh, I love the name so much. Thank you very, very much. I like how no matter how we make this list, I swear to God, you always get Tenno. I, I think I do. <laughs> I think maybe I plan it out that way secretly just so I could say it. Well, hey, thank you, Amy, for being cool. Thanks to Christopher Platt. Dan Rutter, our friend from Australia. Thank you very, very much. I think you're supposed to do that in an Australian accent. No, I don't <laughs> think I am. <laughs> thank you, Joe Roth. Thanks, Joyce Rugg. Karulis, thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole Rawls. Thanks, Sarah Fisher. And thank you to Tanner Goodhue. Hey, and thank you, Thomas Wagstaff. Thank you all for being our patrons. Yeah, thank you guys so, so much. We literally could not do this thing without you, and we appreciate you. You're the best. We, we love you so much. It's, you're in the room every time that we record these. I don't know if you realize it. It's not a very big room, so we all get very close while we're in here. So I just appreciate every one of you and that you're all so cool to hang out with. Thank you all so much, and uh, let's get on to the episode. Hello, seekers, confessors, wizards, and sorceresses, and welcome to the Sort of Truth podcast, the chapter by chapter reread of the Sort of Truth series with a sassy craft Ooh. brew on the side. I'm Nate, and I'm here with my two time traveling companions, Jade and Aaron. Sassy. Hey. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. And today, in front of all of you people, I declare that we will be covering part four of Dead of Bones. Okay. You it people. was weird now. It's going to sound really cool in post. You, I promise. You, the you people part? Yeah. Yeah, that part. You people. <laughs> uh, for all of you listening along on Audible, this section of the book is going to be from one hour, 35 minutes to two hours and about five minutes. That'll get you there. Everything we're going to talk about today. I concur. That'll get you, That'll get you oh. right, <laughs> right there. That's the right spot. And that's where I like to be in. Right you know in what I mean? Pocket. Right in the pocket. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you had something to say. That's why I waited. Uh, my mama told me if you don't have nothing nice to say, don't say nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing nice to say to you people. Oh, all right. Seems like we have our beers and we're all set to go. So let's hop right into this thing. Yeah. Well, as, hey, I'm starting to come around, as always. It's, I mean, we've always had pretty good service here. The Green Eyed yeah. Monster. Green Eyed Green Eyed Beast. It's the Green Eyed Beast. It's not. It's <laughs> not Monster. It's definitely you not just Monster. Got the nice bartender to like you. So you know. So just let's just. Let's just be real cool today and just try not upset anybody else. I'm cool every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, when we last left, Mariska, the creepy what's in your sack lady, snuck into Abby's room at the inn and threatened to kill her daughter if she doesn't get the first wizard to follow her to Coney Crossing the next morning. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Which, you know, uh, with a knife, too. It was she threatened her with a knife that oh, yeah. she was going to kill her daughter, probably with the same knife. I, I yeah, would she probably has more than one knife. They always do the, I mean, we talked about it in the last episode, so we don't have to go too deep into it here, but she did do the whole, and then I'm going to stab the person so that oh, the other person yeah. sees the other person hurt, and then I'm going to kill that person, and it's just like that. You're not, you're not really going to do all that work. <laughs> I don't think you're going to do it. That, and it's not original. Everyone does the, I'm going to make you watch thing. It's bad guy find, monologuing. Find yeah. something new. He made me watch. <laughs> I don't always got to do these remakes. So we arrive at the next morning. Abby is heading up to the keep with Delora and the Mother Confessor because the first wizard has agreed to see her. She's finally going to get her fucking meeting. This is a big deal. And starts the reader thinking that maybe he's not such a bad guy after all. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. heard her plight and accepted. Well, and as a reader, we know, we know that, you know, he has a child that is also in a you know, similar, if not more dangerous situation right. than Mariska. So, you no, not Mariska, Abby. So, you know, Abby. like, we know his perspective a little bit on this So and that he can't just upend the army to go save one little girl just because right. Abby's upset with it. You he know? does have a whole war to consider. Right. Yeah. Right. But it does work to make Abby feel shitty about what she has to do. Well, she, she, uh, yeah, it does say that, like, she feels bad, but then her actions don't always follow what we're being told she's feeling. I want to lay groundwork on that <laughs> early. She's saving her kid. No, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. There is a moral, like, kind of line that yeah. gets toyed with a lot in this book. So oh, I yeah. fully suspect we all have different opinions at one time or another. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending on, you know, where you're at. There, it, there is no right or wrong, you know, like all three of us can be right and all three of us could have vastly different opinions. That's but true. But it depends on if are you are looking big, you look at, you know, macro, micro, greater good, lesser good, all that stuff. Yeah. Delora asks Abby if she's feeling all right because she is looking a little rough. I wonder why. <laughs> well, she says that she just didn't get enough sleep last night. That'll do it. Yeah. So, she, you know, the tired eyes. Oh, yeah. She totally skips the part about being involved in a plot to kill the first wizard. Just probably must have forgot, you know, because of the lack of sleep. I hear that happens. Yeah. Yeah. They say, like, if you're going to take a test, you, the worst thing you can do is stay up all night cramming. You're, you're yeah. better off going to sleep. And then, you know, Abby tried to cram last night. That's why I have a horrible memory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why. <laughs> uh, well, as they walk, people fall silent. Abby actually does see Thomas, the wizard who was arguing with the first wizard during Abby's first visit. Mm -hmm. uh, he's grumbling to himself. He's holding papers with magical symbols on him. Still upset, apparently, at being told off the first time. I just thought this was a great little comical moment. It's just funny that she's like, I wonder what that fucking guy's deal is. <laughs> Well, and especially because in front, like he got kind of shown up in front of like a whole room of people. Yeah, so, that's true too. You know, of course, he's still holding on about that. I would have probably gone to the bar and started grumbling about it. <laughs> that's a really good point, actually. Now he's on a mission. Yeah. No, I got to prove him wrong. <laughs> well, near the end of the rampart, Delora knocks on a door and doesn't wait for a reply. She just goes in because he never hears her knock. She doesn't say who it is right away. The room is filled with boxes and substances and books with symbols and like food everywhere. And we find that this is where Zed lives. Yeah. yeah. It's his place. It's perfect though, right? I mean, everything that's in the wizard space. Oh, yeah. Just like weird things everywhere. Substances, you know, you probably mm -hmm. shouldn't touch. It's Zed. So obviously there's going to be food. Oh, most of those substances are food. Are, are just leftover food? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's experimenting on pickling different things. So when I read that and thought, oh, magical substances, probably a, a glowing yeah. jar of something up on the shelf. Yeah, it's, it's like, no, it's something sticky on the floor. And I don't know if it's cheese. It's brine. <laughs> it's just brine. Just straight brine. <laughs> it might be magic brine, but it's just brine. It is interesting that... His both his conference room where he met her in the first place and here 
it is very much the same vibe. He doesn't have like a, I'm clean, like this is my front that I'm putting on for people. You know what I mean? Because like the room that she saw him in initially with all the people was also just chaotic. Oh, it was and the crazy same way. And filled yeah. with things. So he doesn't like put a front on for other people. It's not like a lot of people who are like, this is my secret chamber. This is where I'm comfortable. No, that's, that's just that he is who he is. That's everywhere. right. He knew they were showing up that yeah. day and oh, yeah. didn't clean up. Yeah. <laughs> He's much too busy for that shit. Yeah. Well, the first wizard is seen reading a book at his desk when they announce Abby's entry. He says, bags, woman. I heard you knock, as I always do. <laughs> and then turns to Abby and gives a pleasant welcome. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I love how matter of factly Abby is told, hey, I had to knock on the door. But we're going in anyway, because he never hears the knock. And immediately, Zed comes in going, I heard you knock. This is what Terry's good at. It's a small little encapsulation of who these people are at their heart. It's like, oh, yeah. Zed always hears. But because of this interaction we get, he doesn't usually acknowledge that he ever hears, because that's not important. Oh, like, yeah. He just knows they're going to come in anyway, bothering him or coming in for a good reason. So why respond? Because they're it, coming in anyway. You know, but he's smart enough to be like, no, I, the knocking means you're coming in. You don't have to announce yourselves. That's why I don't respond to the knocking, because you come in anyway. <laughs> also, we set this meeting. I knew it yeah. was going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And, right, exactly. And you're I, my nine o'clock. And I think it, there's like an undertone of like, we know that both the confessor and the sorceress came up to him last night after he got done talking to everybody else. And we we're like, hey you got to do this thing. And they probably, you know, their relationship obviously is comfortable with each other. So they were probably like, I don't give a shit. You have to do it. Like, they probably bullied him a little bit in a night, you know, in a friendly way. Like, no, we think you need to do this. So he's giving it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, you guys are in charge. I fucking know. Okay. <laughs> That's doing why what he you didn't clean to. up. Good point, too. Yeah. He just said, fuck it. You're coming in my mess this morning. Yeah. That's on you. Yeah. I don't want you here. Exactly. You want you here. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah. Is the, the comic version of this is where Zed's just like, I just don't want you in. That's why I don't <laughs> answer the door. But you just come in anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You forced me to have this meeting. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> that, yeah. That was the vibe I was getting. Well, at the very least, she's nervous and is humble. She thanks him for seeing her. Because lives of innocent children are at stake. The first wizard responds in a, I'm going to say weird, but like also kind of cool way. Uh, he responds by asking her where the line is exactly. That a life becomes less valuable. Why are the lives of children being at stake held higher than the lives of everybody else? And it's just like this is our first official meeting when you're not totally overwhelmed and I'm going to throw you for an absolute ringer. I loved it because it's so much like, I feel like a lot of times things like children or I, I don't know, there's a lot of things that get thrown up as kind of a shield or a, you know, this is the, you can't argue with this. It's a child. These are children that are at stake. So why, how, why would you even like argue about this? This is a state stated thing. And if you're if you argue against us, you're a fucking monster. And I I think that that it's valid to be able to be like, hey, no, we can question that. Where is the line? Why do why do those people deserve more safety or protection than other people who have lived 20, 30 years? Yeah. You know, just because. Yes, they have their whole lives ahead. of The other people have lived their whole lives and still have more to live. Why do they not matter? Yeah. One could argue the older person has a bigger stake in the world, has affected more people, and is, you know, currently holding up a part of society where the child has not yet, but they have the potential to do so. So, I mean, everybody's important. I do think it's interesting, considering that we know somebody's thoughts, uh, the author's thoughts, maybe, on life versus choice. So it's interesting to me oh, yeah. that he is making a point here of being like, where is the line? <laughs> Who matters more? Considering that there are very, very young, quote unquote, lives at stake in one scenario that are being treated as more important than the other. Yeah. And it's flipped. Well, and I, as I say, I have a few things I want to add, but there's one more line that needs to be said before I want to add my thing. So... Do do the, the the don't worry. 
I'll hop in. But I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> oh, holding good. my turn for the moment. Okay. Uh, in short, Zed says, don't play on my emotions by using kids. All life has value, and dead is dead, no matter the age. He asks the MC to report on the council. She says they want it done. It being the crazy spell that will end the war. Which, like we said, uh, we discussed, we believe is the whole unleashing the underworld. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 The first wizard says, apparently the council doesn't even care about kids as long as they're to Haran. Nobody cares because they don't have to do it. He does. That. 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 This, <laughs> all right. That right I am there. no longer holding my turn. <laughs> this, this is why it's such a beautiful, kind of what you were saying, Jade. Like, this is something that it's like, at surface level, you, your first thought is like, no, you can't argue against or where the line is because the whole thing is like, if you're not with me, you're a monster. But then there's this extra part. Where it's like, all right, let's settle where the line is. Let's even have that debate and say eight years old. And then you say no one under eight should be killed. But then you go into it and be like, what about the kids of the bad guys? They're still oh, under yeah. eight, so they're innocent, right? Yeah. Not going to kill them. Yeah. But now they're lumped in with the bad guys, and now there is no age, age line. You know, so it's like, it's, it's such a fascinating, you know, philosophical thing here. This could be a little bit of a downer, but just this morning... I was on my phone and I stumbled across a a drone video footage of the you know the the crisis in the Middle East right now. Oh. And it was a drone shot of a Palestinian child being shot because oh. he was trying to help another Palestinian child that had been shot. And it's just one of those things of like yeah, they're on the opposite side of you, but like what did those kids do? Yeah. They didn't do anything. Yeah. I'm Sure, they would fall under most people's age lines, but they're on the wrong side, so now they're bad. You know, we discussed the the powerful spell being maybe equivalent to a nuke. You know, like there is a lot of things that are very relatable. Oh, you yeah. know, still, even though this book was written what thirty years ago, twenty years ago, uh, roughly twenty. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a great entry point into discussing bigger things. Because you don't realize you're discussing the bigger things. You just think you're talking about this fictional yeah, book series. Exactly. Yeah. It's great. It's I that's one of the things I really enjoy about these books is they do make you think about bigger stuff. Yeah. Even when you don't realize it. It's it's interesting to me. And also I think uh this would be another sneaky Terry moment because he definitely this is one of the things that was in yeah. there that he was just like, hey, think about that for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> and it's honestly another thing. We could do an entire episode just talking about this. 100%. This and one I question right will. here. Where's the age line? That could be a whole hour. That could be a lecture series. Because really, I mean, I don't know that anybody's going to come out right on that, but it's it is just interesting to debate mm-hmm. and have think about those ideas for a little while. Mhm. Uh okay, now I got to find my spot back. <laughs> <laughs> Zed is talking about the fact that whatever this spell is, he's the one that they want to perform the action. And so they can kind of not think about what the end result, even though they may desire the end result. Mm -hmm. He's the one that's going to have to be the bringer, the the wind of death, I guess we'll call it. And I think that's the second question, or maybe not question, but the second concept is that a lot of people can have a lot of big ideas about things when they aren't tied to it directly exactly what either doing the thing themselves or having it done to them you can you can say and think all these things and in, in concept that you want but when it's you that's having to do the thing or face those those consequences it's different and so i don't know it, it adds a whole nother layer to it like yes we can all have your very strong hot opinions mm-hmm. but if you were in that seat you might make a different choice whether you yeah. believe that to your core or not. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Zed has to make the choice. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can have this discussion, and then the tough choice we have afterwards is what toppings we're getting on our pizza later. <laughs> Zed's right. having this discussion and then going to go do the thing. Yeah. yeah. I, obviously, that's, yeah, that's a very different situation to be in. Well, he stares at Abby profoundly a moment before he asks to see the bone. Mm-hmm. And Abby, show me a bone. <laughs> <laughs> Abby what says, "What about your bone?" I'm sorry. Continue. <laughs> Abby says, "Maybe this will mean more to you than saving innocent people." 
But she ditched the kid argument, though. I mean, so maybe a little bit credit because he did strike that one down immediately. But Abby reaches into her bag and pulls out not a dumb fucking jug she made, but her own mother's skull, handing it to the wizard and says, this is a debt of bones and I declare it due. (laughs) So if you could just... Uh, uh, do that. That would be that would be real quick. <laughs> she had to dig it up too. It's not like it like magically popped into her. <laughs> like, oh you yeah. Know, you think in a book of magic, something shit like this would just like pop up onto her desk. Like once her mom died or whatever, she would just have like a oh the skull just cleanly popped up on my desk and was like hey I have a bone debt ha 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 ha. But no, she had to <laughs> dig this shit up and and pull it out of the ground because she knew that there was a bone debt and she had to do that. I was just trying to consider whether sorceresses, especially a sorceress that had a known debt of bones going on kind of a thing, do they get buried? Do, is there like a... It we're says gonna she had to dig her up. Burn the, it did, oh my God. So she had to... Oh, fuck. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking... Yeah. I'm sorry. I just... Th- yeah. Yeah. And you gotta hope that you did it. You waited. <laughs> you, gotta you gotta hope you waited long like, enough. You know. So she doesn't even know this. Her mom just told her, and then she died. But like in the back of her head, she's like, "Sorceresses are mysterious. They don't really always divulge all the information." So yeah. really, we're not even a hundred percent sure if this dead of bones is actually active right now because it might have had something to do with her mom dying. You don't know. She didn't tell you. She told her that it passed on. To me, it seems like maybe we need to reset our way of thinking. And the only way I know how to do that, beer. Beer sounds good. Beer. Uh, well, hey, uh, actually, you know what? Over another beer. You know what? I think I'm going to get a mead today. Ooh, you, yeah, got, you got mead? mead. mead? I will love yeah. one. I know I just took the order, but can one of you go get it? No. Fuck. All right, I'll be back. We are going to take a quick break, and we'll be back right after this. Hey, Aaron. I think that this is a wonderful opportunity for you to try to improve the relationship between you and Maggie. I need you to ask her fucking nicely (laughs) what kind of meat this is. Okay, I will try. I'll try. I'll try. Okay. Um, excuse me, Maggie. What kind of mead is this that you've given us? Please. This mead's from Adesanya Meadery, okay? I gave you the bottle. Just read off the bottle. Thanks, Maggie. <laughs> Is this what you wanted? Yeah. You Thank know what? You, Maggie. You got to you know what? I'd say progress. I'd say <sighs> Yeah. Okay. Well, I feel better than minimal we've amount got, of progress. We've, I, <laughs> progress. Hey, we've got the meat, I guess. <laughs> uh this bottle says that is very tiny writing. You need glasses. You want me to read it? <laughs> Some of us remember growing up on a particular variety box of instant breakfast deliciousness. For those of you that don't, this is our take on that bit of nostalgia. Share, sip, and enjoy. Uh, By the way, this bad boy clocks in at 14%. Oh, buddy. Maggie didn't say the name of it. Oh, this is raspberry and chocolate old school breakfast from Adesanya Meadery. This smells real good. Instant deliciousness. You know something funny? The instant breakfast that I think that they are referring to, my dad would give that to us when we didn't feel good and we couldn't eat a lot of food. Feel And it was like the instant breakfast stuff. And so I didn't like them. And I think I have blocked out the flavor profile of those in my brain because I only got them when I was like sick. It comes on strong. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Very in, strong. In the first... 1.5 seconds. I was ready to give this a three. However, that settles nicely. Yeah. I really enjoy the long aftertaste that comes in. And I, I feels like maybe I'm saying it like I don't enjoy it, but I tr- I really do. It's weird because the first hit yeah. of the flavor, I'm not a big fan of. But the it's, aftertaste, yeah. the thing that lasts a lot longer, that's great. It's like it needs to settle. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we we waited too long to drink this bottle or something. But like, man, it's good. This is what they're talking about. I'm pretty sure the Carnation Instant Breakfast. Ah, I still have those for breakfast today. (laughs) Yeah, I literally um, had one this morning. (laughs) We only got them when we were like sick. Oh, fascinating. So, what do you guys think? I think I'm going to give it 
six pop tarts six pop tarts i think that even though the after effect lasts for like 5 seconds i think that first 1.5 i'm conflicted what to take a second sip even though i know i'm going to like it eventually <laughs> i'm going to be honest with you now I'm not really digging the smell i think i'm going to give this one a 5 i think it's very good when it tastes good but there is something in there that i'm not digging and so i think it might balance each other out middle of the road 5 it's fine I think a lot of meads have this, uh, the sour that yeah. hits you really hard. Almost like a tart bite. Right. And you have to either like that or take that into account when drinking it. So I think I'm going to give it like a seven probably. Okay. Because when it's in my mouth, I mean, it's a strange experience that we're on. When I swallow it, I'm happy. I know I don't really hate it that much. I think I just need to drink more meads. And hey, we're here in the Midlands. So I'm going to probably, my tongue will attune. It'll be great. That's right. We're probably not going to be able to find this anywhere else. Yeah. Except maybe Granville, Michigan. Whatever. All right. Well, why don't we get back to the book? Let's go. Ching. (laughs) (laughs) And we are back. And we're actually back to the front cover of the book. Yeah, this is the thing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is the scene uh, because Zed actually has the skull in his hand and is considering it. And there is a woman there, too. (laughs) (laughs) What it doesn't really, really show, at least I didn't think in the art, was that Zed, uh, the first wizard, excuse me, we don't know him as Zed quite yet. We know his name is Zed. We know who, this is who it is. I've been trying to just say first wizard until they were actually introduced. Yeah, we, we know that this is Zedekus Zul Zarander, the exactly. first wizard. He's never been addressed as we know him as Z- just Zed yet. Yeah. I don't think. Maybe Thomas has. I don't know. It's kind of like she's meeting a president. Like, yeah. you don't, you try to use some, I guess, formality. Maybe not. I don't really know. Or at least, like, somebody of importance. Head of whoever, like, I guess, I mean, if we're saying that this spell would be like nukes, then, I mean, it would be like, this is the guy who holds the key to the nukes. Yeah. Pretty important. Pusher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he is very shocked because normally you don't have to bring a whole <laughs> skull. You just need a little piece of it. Yeah. Just a tiny piece smaller than a grain of sand would be enough, but that would be really hard to keep track of. So that wouldn't be very practical. <laughs> Sax famously not great at holding tiny particle like things. And after our last discussion, just before we went to break, the whole thing about having to actually dig up her mom and like do the whole thing, I, what would be the easiest? Like, if you gotta look, look, if you gotta cut something off, what's gonna be the least horrible way to go about doing that? Abby had to do that. I didn't consider any of this before. Holy fuck, this is horrifying. It is horrifying. But also, (laughs) what better way to show the gravity of a situation than having him hold the skull of somebody in his hand and be like, this is real people. We're dealing with real people. You know, know, that's interesting, too, because then she didn't just show up with a little chip of bone. She's like, I took her whole head, motherfucker. This is what I'm trying to impress upon you. It's very important. And then he's holding a skull of a person in his hand while he's having to weigh the weight of the dead of bones and her, you know, request. Dob wild. I think it's two things. And I think that's absolutely part one. I do think part two, though, is that she did have to be, you know, think of like because she says she goes, my mom never told me. The specific, she just said, I got to right. bring you bone. I didn't know it was, you know, only to be a sliver. So I'm also thinking like, she has to think of like, what's the easiest bone to transport? You know, where it's like tiny that's little true. finger bones. Those could get lost. Yeah. Pelvis. That's kind of big, but skull. <laughs> well, it's just a nice little hip. That'll fit in a sack. Round ball. Yeah. Perfectly in a sack. <laughs> and also it's significant. This was her head. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? I feel like ah, I'm going to take the shoulder. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Kneecap. Kneecap is also a nice little handful. Yeah, there you go. That w- Actually, that would have been nice. Big enough to not just lose. But that's. I think that's where the first part of, hey, no, 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 I'm picking the head. This is a person. This is not a that's kneecap. That's right. A this reminder a that person. it was a human being. Yeah. This is almost a face. Yeah. Yeah. You could still look into their eyes, technically. Exactly. Even if it's a skull, which does make it real. I, I agree with that. That would, it would add some significance for me, I think. Mm-hmm. 
And you can also puppet it. <laughs> or whatever. Could you imagine <laughs> if Zed was like, hey, House, what's up? Oh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's funny. And just in front of Abby. Yeah. And she's like, the fuck are you doing? He's like, oh, this is how wizards do things. Hey, I have to imagine. We we looked at the map. You got if, a dead about? Yeah, I do. If where we think Coney Crossing is, is where it is, and Aiden Drill is where it is, that's a long trip. It doesn't sound like Abby has a lot of money. She's got to pay for travel somehow. And I'm oh, thinking God. she went tavern to tavern doing a quote unquote two woman show. <laughs> oh. of her and her mother wow <laughs> that's the uh, origin of like that's the Jeff Dunham story yeah, right yeah, yeah. that's where Jeff got it <laughs> <laughs> oh that's disgusting you gross sick fuck <laughs> that's her mom <laughs> that's her mom <laughs> and if there's one thing I respect it's people's moms <laughs> Well, beneath the first wizard's fingers the bone starts to glow this is the test he confirms that yes it is a debt of bones bound by the magic invoked until it's paid. And Abby is like, ha, I told you. But the first wizard says, no, nah, it doesn't have to be paid right now. But Abby declares that it does. Yeah, motherfucker. Like, I don't want to keep dragging this on. And also my child is in debt. And also I might not have a descendant to for it to pass down to. So this is my one chance to cash in. Yeah. Give me my prize. But then, you know, the flip side to that is now she's raised her voice and made a demand of the first wizard, and then she prepares to die for running her <laughs> mouth to said first wizard. But luckily, the mother confessor is there and just cools everybody down and, and moves the conversation along by asking what else he knows about the test. I did think this was a bit interesting because there's a little bit of back and forth where Abby is revealed to not really know much about this whole process, but then makes demands as if she knows exactly what the fuck this process is. And Zed counters it every time of like, you brought me the whole skull? Didn't need to. And she goes, well, I, I didn't know. Like, well, you got to pay the debt. He goes, no, I don't. Yes, you do. I know what's happening. You have to pay it right now. And he goes, you, you didn't know you, you didn't need to bring the whole skull, woman. Yeah. No, I don't have to fill it right now. And we know that her mom didn't tell her anything else about this. So she really yeah. does not know. She it's it actually now that you bring that she's up. She's desperate. It I get is it. Weird, she's desperate. Very desperate. Yeah. But it is it is a little funny that she has such conviction on some of the things she's saying cuz we know she doesn't really know. What the fuck is the point of a dead of bones if you could just keep telling me I'll pay that later? Great point. And you could die and the also next person true. can die. Like, at some, especially when there's magic involved, like, I would have, like, what's going to, I'd be like, motherfucker, what triggers it then? Yeah, that's, How do I trigger this dead of fucking bones, bitch? That's the flip side of it, <laughs> is Abby doesn't know that Zed is for sure telling her the truth, right? That's true, This too. first mm -hmm. wizard could just not want to pay the thing, so he's like, oh, my wizard power tells me, oh, I've got a thousand years to pay this. Like, we're good. Yeah. She doesn't know, so she needs it now. I've she definitely, definitely picked up conflicting vibes on like how Abby feels about magic. Clearly, her mother was a sorceress, but even then, like, I think there was a quote in there where like she talked about how her mom even told her, like, careful with people with magic, you know? So that's, uh, yeah, like, yeah, I can see where she's confused and I can see that. But this, this woman makes a lot of demands on stuff that she very clearly does not know what's going on. Well, yeah, I'm just saying at this point, like, I would be like, what's the point of a contract? And that's, right? yeah, that's true. Like, the whole yeah. thing is you have a debt to pay to me. And if you could just keep giving me an IOU, then, this is, then it's not nullified. Like, right? There's no fucking point. So pay up or wizards are all shit. And I'm going to go in the street and tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now I am thinking they of. They ate shit. <laughs> I am thinking of Dumb and Dumber now, where Zed just goes, now this, snaps paper, <laughs> is a perfectly good I-O-U, yeah. oh. and you just cash that in later. <laughs> you just check it out. Every dollar accounted for. Yep, yeah. it's all there. <laughs> <laughs> what he knows about this debt, he says it is the same one that his father told him about. It does belong to Abby. These are things we know for sure. We have the right players in the right place. But what the debt was for must have slipped his mind. Mm. Dolores says, and you dare to call sorceresses taciturn. By the way, 
taciturn. <laughs> Adjective. Reserved or uncommunicative in speech, saying little. I had no idea what the fuck that was. Nope, never heard that word in my life I was before like, this. Does that make it a bad joke? Which she's like, and you think sorcerers? I was like, no, that's a smart person joke. I just didn't know that word, so I <laughs> didn't get to be in on it the first go around. As we all know, jokes are funnier when you have to explain them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. Uh, you've said this several times. Yeah. Well, the first wizard turns to the mother confessor and says, the council wants it done, do they? He smiles. A grim smile. I'm going to say that again. He <laughs> smiles a grim smile. Yeah, I, I didn't feel great about that. <laughs> yeah. So far, this has been a, a young guy who's like, oh, he's the wind of death. Don't worry about that. It's just a sound scary. And then you go in there and he's all like, yeah, you know, I'm logical, but I'm not a dick. And then, then he does the villain face and you're like, whoa, what's that? There's a turn coming. What's happening? Yeah. There's definitely two conversations happening, mm -hmm. and not everybody is privy to all of the information in the room. But the main point of what this weird grim smile is, is that he agrees that the weird big end the war spell, he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. He says, well, if they want it done, then it's going to be done. And he just made that decision based on this dead of bones, which is interesting. Yeah, off his conversation with Abby, which... Kind of triggers Abby because she, for the first time in the book, is refusing to take the back seat. No, she finally has her audience with the first wizard. The first time she was in the chamber, there was a lot of conversations going on at once. This time, there are two conversations going on at once. And when Zed turns to like talk about the council, Abby gets upset and she's like, hey, are you going to do my thing or not? Like She still doesn't see they may be intertwined. And she, I mean, we've been listening, and granted, she has her kid on her mind, so that's what's taking up a lot of her mind, but she has not been listening to what's yeah. going on around her, very obviously, because they've been making very clear references to the fact that a lot of children are going to die, the underworld might come back because of this, the council wants it, and he just said, I'm going to do it, and she's like, yeah, well, whatever about your other fucking thing. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, don't care at all about that. What about my thing? Which yeah. I get. Your kid's in danger. Let's take care of it. But also, also. <laughs> and I love his answer because he's like, well, you called it due. Uh, there's nothing that I can do against that as a, as a humble first wizard. Uh, it, it was your call. So if you say it's due, it's due. The, the monkey's paw has curled. <laughs> hey, hey, Abby, I'm going to help you protect your daughter. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm going to do. Because that's what you asked. That's exactly what you asked Not for. Not saying you're going to get what you thought you were asking. Yeah. Hey, but Abby, I am going to protect your daughter. I am going to help you. Help me, help you, help me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what, like, I, I get that it's a relief to her that that's going to happen. But also, like, as I'm reading, my hackles are, are raising. Oh, yes. Because... He's been so, you know, against all of these things. He's been against going with the council. He's been against honoring this debt. And then all of a sudden, in two seconds, when we didn't even see what happened. Now he's going He just tested in. it and he was like, okay, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know what? Fuck all my other plans. Fuck all my other thoughts. Yeah, this is all good. Yeah, we're going to do that. And he's smiling about it. He's all happy and cheery and he's too happy about it. Smiling grimly and then looking at Abby and saying... I was going to Coney Crossing anyway, no, which you is now, no, you weren't right for one, but for now, this is the second time that this has been said to Abby in like roughly 10 hours. Yeah. Somebody grimly looking at her and going, I'm going to Coney Crossing and probably having something of a bad idea in their brain. Yeah. But that's the thing. You literally were just saying you didn't want to do the thing. So you didn't know if you were going to do it. And now within the conversation I'm here for, you're going to tell me you were going there anyways. I want questions. I have questions, you sir. You do, but Abby does not. <laughs> I <know>. Abby <laughs> feels relief. I know. <laughs> She's going to get the wizard to do the thing. He grips her shoulders and says, we're bound, you and I, in a debt of bones. His smile looked sad, but sincere as he handed Abby her mother's skull back <laughs> and says, please call me Zed. There it is. Now he's sad. Now he's sad. <laughs> Which feels like this should be a happier moment, but like we kind of just nailed in the coffin. Not a happy moment. Yeah. Because like, it's the same thing. I 
like when you said your hackles got raised, that was what I thought. Like I'm like, this is monkey's paw. This it does. Good things are not about to follow. It does feel like he's like, we can be friends now that we're going to die soon, which is not great. Um, outside, they were accosted by a crowd. Thomas has to talk to him. This is frustrated Thomas. He is still frustrated. Zed says, talk then, and keeps walking, and the whole crowd follows. <laughs> it's like now it's the first wizard's chamber, but mobile. No worry for Homeland Security. We're just doing this on the street in yeah, front of we, all the people. We just out here. Well, Thomas says that the spell that Zed's about to do is fucking crazy, but Zed never said it wasn't. Thomas says you can't do this, but Zed says the council is making him. And also, Thomas was kind of saying that I want to see if you can do the spell. Like, can you do the spell? I'm here on behalf of the council. At least that's what it felt like to me earlier, you know? Yeah. And as soon as Zed showed that he could, all of a sudden now Tom's like, wait, no, no, yeah. hold on, bud. Now the council wants do to not do, it, do it. And now he's going, holy shit. Yeah. No, there's a whole lot bad with this. It's like, I think it's one of those things where like, this is Terry foreshadowing. This is going to be similar to Abby. It's my prediction is Zed's going to start saving, doing what he said. And then she's going to go, wait. Not like this, though. Hold on. Hold on. Not like this. This is going to be a bad idea. Yeah. Well, he saw the grace, and now he's like, oh, we're perverting, mm -hmm. like, magic when we're doing this, and that's not, a, like, yeah, ah! Yeah. The grace was fucked up. That's a yeah. huge deal. Like, yeah. to, to magic casters, I guess, that the way that's done is imperative to the rest of the magic you do. It's order. So if it's weird, then ah, you, you could fuck with, like, life itself. Uh, Thomas says, no, Zed, you can't fucking do this. It makes intense heat. It's probably going to kill you or literally everybody else. <laughs> and Zed comes back with the best fucking... He's like, oh, you think casting a light spell that will rip the fabric of the world of life might cause an instability in the web field? You think that might happen, Thomas? You think it might be fucking hot? You think? You think the most <laughs> destructive piece of magic you've ever seen in your entire life might be dangerous. Well, and, and speaking of the previous analogy that we pulled from this, like setting off a nuke, this is a conversation that happened because you had a bunch of theoretical physicists talking about theoretical physics. And then it came to a time when the military said, okay, do a test. And they finally were just like, okay. And like mm. before they did the test, like the day of, one of the physicists was talking to one of the military guys, or this, you know, this is more of the narrative played in the movie Oppenheimer. Oh yeah. But they, they're talking and they go, yeah. Or they start taking bets and the military guy goes, what's the betting for? And they goes, Oh, whether or not we're going to light the atmosphere on fire. <laughs> and the military guy goes, what? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, we don't know if it's going to do it or not, but you guys want to test. You didn't ask the question. So here we go. Yeah. And they said when they tested the first nuke, there was a non-zero chance that the atmosphere was going to ignite and continue to ignite exponentially. That little word, non-zero, or the, the little combination, after I've started considering that, what that really means, yeah. it's like, no, everything is terrifying. The world could yeah. have ended on that test. Oh, fucking yeah. wild. And I, that's kind of, that's what we have here. But that's where Thomas is coming from. It could go really, really Really, really bad. Yeah, I don't like bad times. And so I think, uh, before we get to the very potentially world-destructive thing, why don't we just take a break and have a beer? That sounds good to me. We are going to take a little break, and we will be back right after this. And we are back for the remainder of part four of Dead of Bones. Not a chapter. <laughs> Not a chapter. <laughs> Well, Zed starts to walk away from Thomas, but Thomas says that he'll breach the grace, the thing we were just talking about. Not good to do that. He's not going to be able to control the spell, and his arrogance is going to kill them all. Thomas then demands to see the spell. He's like, you guys don't show me shit. You don't show me all the shit anyways. I want to see all the shit. He wants the source. He wants the papers. Yeah. Because Zed already showed him the spell. Yeah. He can make the thing go. Yeah. But he's like, I want to see the rules for all of this. Mm -hmm. And Zed, I fucking love Zed. Not as he only already done with this conversation by walking away. Oh, yeah. Then he just bops this dude on the nose by saying, Thomas, if you were the first wizard, then you could have access to first wizard stuff. Thomas, 
Are you the first wizard? <laughs> oh, no. you're not? No, Zed. Well, then get fucked, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> That's not exactly what he says, but it was the equivalent of that. Yeah. Thomas turns beet red, I guess is the point. Zed says, Sometimes all that's left is an act of desperation. I'm the first wizard, and I say we're doing it. And that's fucking that. Zed has made his choice. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? Bitch. Nothing. First wizard, I got the badge. <laughs> also the power, and I could just, like, walk over there and do it. So... Yeah. I love <laughs> just now how you said I got the power and immediately I was reminded of the song. I got the power. Bum, bum, bum. Anyways. <laughs> Zed starts giving orders to prepare for a ride to Coney Crossing. They are leaving immediately. He's made his choice. Now there's no more sitting around. It's time to go. When a high-ranking officer wants the plan, Zed says, a Nargo... Panis Rawls' right-hand man is the one sending death at them, and he is just going to send it back. No big deal. Don't worry about it. Super simple. Hey, all this bad stuff coming our way, I'm just going to turn around. Super simple thing to do. Like, if if it was that simple, Zet, you'd have done it already. He's going to go over there, and he's going to say, I'm rubber, you're glue. (laughs) Whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you, and it's going to turn right around in the air. And go right back at him. I forgot about the spell. Yeah. <laughs> right, right after they yeah. fire the first volley of arrows, he just real quick, I'm rubber, you're glue. Yeah. <laughs> and then it shoots around. I, oh man, that's so much better than what I had. I was thinking <laughs> George of the Jungle, where oh. they have that whole wrestling scene because there's the rubber tree and they bounce off it. Oh. <laughs> He just turns all the trees to rubber. Yours is infinitely better. <laughs> and I believe actual magic uh, mm-hmm. because magic can just be a trick, right? Some of the best magic is. And as a kid, when someone said that to you, <laughs> <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> it's the ultimate defense. But now it just comes back it got to me you. every time. No, I just said, fuck me. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that ruined days for sure. <laughs> Well, Anargo holds the crossing right now, but they're surrounded and they're not running. The question is, why? Zed says he wants to draw them in, obviously, kill Zed, and then the war is done. Then the bad guys win. Stunned, the officer asks, so you're going to go in there? You don't even know what the plan is exactly. You don't know what they're, you know what it is they're doing, but you don't know how they're going to go about it. You don't know anything else about the scenario. You don't know what the camp looks like. You don't know where the guards are. The scouts are like, you're going to get fucking killed for sure. Wizard or not. And he's like, yeah, this was a little bit frustrating to read because the way this, this is where it's like, because I know we've had this thing before where it feels like sometimes Terry's trying to hit a word count because it it says, Hey, what are you doing? I'm going to go do this thing. And then the guy he's talking to goes, so you're going to go do the thing. Yes, motherfucker. I just told you I was going to do it when you asked the first time. We've been. Why are you asking again? All morning talking about this. Yeah. And you've been right here. I think part of it is just to illustrate to the reader that Zed knows he's being pulled in Mm because it hasn't been illustrated yet. And so, yes, the double asking is is annoying, but I think it's just to be like, oh, he knows and he's still going. And also, Abby's standing there. Listening to this. Yeah. And like, she shouldn't know that Zed knows he should be going, but she's not listening to anything, any of this stuff because she's so focused on her goal Mm -hmm. that she doesn't realize Zed knows what he's walking into now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is her clue to be in on the plan. And she's so focused that she can't, she has no idea. She's like, oh, we're just going to go there. And I'm following Mariska's orders, but Zed doesn't know that. But Mm -hmm. Zed knows something. Well, in the other part, we know that Abby does have more information, right, with the Mariska mm-hmm. thing. But also, had she not had that interaction with Mariska, I very much feel like Abby would be looking at Zed like, hey, I got my dad. He's going to sort all this shit out. I don't have to do anything. I got the guy. He's going to fix it. We're just going to walk over there. He's going to wave his arms because he's a wizard. Problem solved. What? what do we know about wizards, guys? They use people. Oh. So that Abby is here with Zed 
we should know that that's not the way it's going to fucking go down. Right. It was just interesting to me because, you know, I, I listened to it very quickly. I didn't hear this part the first time. And I was like, oh, it is kind of a turn. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to like spoiler alert, but things are, you know, we know that Mariska's waiting for Zed. Mm-hmm. So Zed's not supposed to know that. But listening back to it and realizing that th- this little interaction did happen, there was an indication that Zed knows it's coming. Hey, as a first time reader, you said it. My hackles are raised. I oh. get the vibe that something bad is about to happen. Okay, so I just I just now realized this. The little comment about Zed saying he was going to Coney Crossing anyway. Do you think that's because he knows? Oh, like he knows that he like there's a plot to get him on yeah, the way to Coney he Crossing. He just made the offhanded comment like, "Yeah, I was going there anyway." So it's like why yeah that, yeah i, that's I think what, that's what that's, you're supposed yeah, to incredible. do yeah. yeah that's kind of what i'm saying because he he states here anargo is trying to draw him in and kill zed and we didn't have any indication that he knew that until the dead of until he touched that bone mm-hmm. he wasn't talking about going there he wasn't talking about any of this and now all of a sudden he was going there anyways and yeah, he knows he, that they were trying to kill him he claims he knew all along yeah you know, like oh so yeah i knew i was gonna go to he Coney figured Crossing. out the plot yeah at that point i think yeah now he has the wizard's equivalent of all the information. Right. Well, he turns to Abby and says, we'll ride hard and we'll be there soon. Cue Jade laugh. <laughs> we'll get there in time and then we'll see to our business. <laughs> Thank you very much for playing along. <laughs> Abby could only nod the relief and the shame. I mean, she's walking him into a trap. But most of all, she was horrified at what she was doing because she knew the Daharan's plan. Yeah. So. The complication here is that Abby is bringing the guy to help her daughter and also bringing the guy to help her daughter into a trap. So it really just depends which fucking trap springs first on whether or not your daughter gets safe. Congratulations. You've gone from 100% death to 50-50 at best. And if you just done the one thing, it'd probably be better than that. I think that's I think that's kind of what I'm saying. Like at this point, she's kind of underestimating Zed's knowledge like she's not paying attention to what's happening around her because she thinks Zed is going in here on the back foot but right from what we can see he's not we suspect he may have an idea about the plan not through anything he said or really I mean through something he said but it was just an offhanded comment so there's really no there's really no knowing quite yet right well they start making their way to Coney Crossing And then this really cool thing happens. There's a line in the book. And then they just get to Coney Crossing. (laughs) Yeah. We spoke about this before we started recording. Because I told Nate that I thought I had a technical error (laughs) with the Kindle version of this book. Because I was like, I am missing pages. Because we talked about leaving and then we arrived. That's never happened before. Zed just found a waypoint. (laughs) He found a waypoint. You know what it is? We've been conditioned by Fast all travel. of these sort of truth books. Yeah. It's like, that's going to take weeks. And the reason that matters is because those weeks are going to be represented in chapters. Mm-hmm. Now we're just like, all right, we got to go to the place and we jump to the place. We're like, whoa, that happened way too fast. What the fuck? What was all the stuff in between? We got to know. Now you're thinking with portals. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think part of it is we normally get interaction between our characters or something happens on the travel. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. obviously this was a mundane thing, but it does lead you to, I mean, it doesn't because it pulls you through so fast. But if you're discussing it, pulling it apart, you're like, what did they do in camp? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what did they talk about? Like, I, I would love to know what kind of, they, do they just go to bed every night and while they're walking, they're just not fucking chatting at all? There's no backstory? They're not, they're not like pouring into each other's lives or talking about the, the trees? What, what the fuck? Sorry, everybody maintains silence and state of mood until we get to the right. place we're going. Stay exactly. angry. <laughs> and I, I don't think it ever is explicitly stated how long it's going to take, but I'm assuming more than one day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, I would imagine. At least small talk would have happened. Yeah. <laughs> They reach Coney Crossing. Apparently, nothing happened the whole way. Nope, there were, it was there fine. were no talks. Nothing bad happened. Three out of five a, a... wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> exactly. No portals um, on the walkway. But when they get to Coney Crossing, something is wrong. Everything and everyone is gone. 
everything that could be eaten had been taken. Saddest part. <laughs> there, <laughs> by the way, no food either. You are not getting dinner tonight. <laughs> Family oh, members, gone. Pets, gone. Livestock, gone. Bummer, but... But is the fridge full? <laughs> it's not. Now it's a tragedy. <laughs> and her house had been left totally bare. Dicks. And again, no fridge in the house. They didn't have them back then, I'm assuming, but no like salted meat or anything in a storage Ooh, no box. No, what I meant. <laughs> well, she heard everything happen from the cellar. And she didn't come upstairs so that she could go for help in case she wasn't found, right? When the house was sacked and everything, she had been here when it happened. Fucking crazy. Wait, she was in the room when it happened? The room when it happened. In the room when it happened? Yeah, sometimes that's all people want. Is to be in the room when it happened? To be in the room when it happened. (laughs) It seems like it might have been cowardice. I mean, people are giving her eyes. You were hiding in the basement. While your family was captured and taken away. Yeah. Well, I do think that the, you know, uh, spoiler alert for 10 seconds from now, the, Zed's questioning is definitely accusatory. But then, yeah, right at the end, he goes, yeah, that was wise. It was logical. Yeah, you did you the right thing. You kept yourself safe. Which that brought me back to the whole, where do you draw the age line thing? He's asking accusatory questions on purpose. He's not yeah. trying to judge or he wants to know. The thought process. He doesn't actually care about your answer. Like, he wants the thought process behind it. And on top of all that, it must have been very difficult to do while she listened to her family be brutalized and, like, literally taken away. It just... Okay, Jade, you've watched Lion King. You know, when Simba is like, (laughs) Papa! And he's... Yeah, but you know, it's that emotion. You're listening to your baby be taken from your house. Yeah, it's the difficult part of it is that, you know, in your in your adrenaline and in your brain, you feel like you could be a badass and kill everything if you needed to, but when, you know, could you actually is it is it better to try and put yourself at risk and 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 stop the thing from happening or <laughs> you know, in my case, I like to think I have a badass and I could, you know, hurt somebody real bad. Actuality probably not. There's a lot of people who are stronger than me and could just like bop me down real easy. So it's like in that situation, is it better for me to run out at an attacker and try and save my baby and then be brutally murdered? Or is it better to wait and have them taken away and then I can go after them with more strength? I don't know. Could you do like the strength of of being able to sit there and wait is also something to talk about like it yeah. seems weak but also that would be very hard to do well, like I, think, I would rather die than let you take my baby actually yeah i think that was zed's point it is hard to do it does seem weak but it's hard to do yeah. because it would be impossible but there was a whole group of people and she was just her there's no way she would have survived had she gone out there yeah it was it would have been certain death for sure and she chose not to do that. Zed uh, does have a mind for the logical decisions, no matter how it looks. And I think we can all appreciate that about him. Yeah. She says they took everyone else into town, right? So it wasn't just like they kicked open the door to her house only. It was the whole town. Uh, and they took everybody else across the river. The enemy camp is set up in the hills just beyond. I don't know why Abby would know that. Well, she probably could see them being taken. Like, you oh, know, okay. she knows yeah. they were gone. So as she's sneaking out. She probably sees him take She's off. She's opening for the, hills. the hatch door and watches yeah. him go. Yeah. I can yeah, see yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I can yeah. see that for sure. Well, it that was just like, like she was there alone for a little while. She could have probably discerned. There's probably a couple footprints. She heard it quiet at, down and then looked at them as they walked away. Probably a trail of blood. Oh yeah, of, of like breadcrumbs, but blood, gotta be a lot of noise. Blood too. crumbs. A lot of crying and screaming. Yeah. I would imagine coming from the hills. Uh, <laughs> Zed. <laughs> Zed stares out across those hills with eyes and says to himself that soon this will be ended. Not a Sup- line from the movie, actually. Super uh, and definitely has the vibe of being very positive. Yeah. <laughs> and vague. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Zed checks the house and then tells Delora to ride back and tell the army to hold in place. If anything goes wrong, just attack. Mm-hmm. Dahara must be stopped. I love hate that this is the plan because he's like, look, I'm going to go do my thing. If my thing is successful, then we're good. If it's not successful, 
we have to fight the Daharans. And if we have to fight the Daharans, we know we're going to lose because of what it is they're doing and where we are. They've got a choke point. I've seen the 300. I know that works. <laughs> That's what's happening here. So he's like, if my thing goes wrong, we're all dead. Which there, yeah. I do take a little bit of solace out of the fact that this is a prequel. So <laughs> I guess there's still a chance Zed could die, but he comes back to life. So like well, Abby survived eh. the one raid. So Zed <laughs> being a wizard could probably survive a war. Yeah, yeah, I know this is technically like book six, but it's also or, you know, it's book one. But news book six. <laughs> so like, I know what happens after this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we saw the, uh, we saw the aftermath of this. Yeah. That's true. So. Yeah. That, but that doesn't mean things might go bad and go horribly wrong still. But like, I, I don't think he dies. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's clearly not happy about this, but in a surprising turn of events, she hugs him and begs him not to leave them without him as the first wizard. Aww. Yeah, it's very sweet. Uh, Delora, I, we get kind of a view of her as being, I want to say, the Verna. Like, very motherly, is there to comfort you if you absolutely need it, but is going to give you a tough fucking time of it beforehand? Yeah. And it's like, but she's still, she's still a human being. She's still been with Zed probably a really long time and doesn't want to see him die either. Yeah, she's compassionate but firm. <laughs> well, what we know, like from what we know, everybody in the keep, they grow up in the keep, right? Yeah, so they've true. all yeah. grown up together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've probably lived most of their lives together. Zed mm -hmm. was raised by the mother confessor, kind of, right? We learned that earlier. Mm -hmm. Right. They have a lot of banter. And so this, I love how it ties back into Thomas. And he's like, and leave you with Thomas as the first wizard? Absolutely fucking not. No. You Loves, hear that guy? Love sassy Zed. <laughs> Well, the dust from Dolores' horse fades away into the horizon as Abby and Zed head down towards the river. On and the that, road again. Yeah, they literally <laughs> Hey, thank you. You didn't pick quite so negative of a place to stop this time. No, they're just, they're hey, off on the quest now. Like, it's kind of not a great outlook, but like, we're on our way to save the kid. You have to have some bad things happen for your heroes to be motivated. So I know the last couple episodes are like, you know, ending on sad spots. But now, now we've got a quest to take mm -hmm. and a glimmer of hope. And baby, that's all we need. Yeah, I, I think not only is that all we need. I dare say it's the truth. <laughs> Not only is this an audio medium where we couldn't <laughs> see you physically drop the bombs, uh, it is an audio medium, and so you did so silently, <laughs> and there was nothing to hear. I was totally enthralled by everything you were doing. I'm a silent actor. <laughs> <laughs> and if you would like to let us know what your truth is, Write in your journey books to podcastatt at gmail.com or follow us on any of our social needs, which are delicious, by the way. Blug, blug, blug. You can also find us on patreon.com slash podcastatt and subscribe to a tier of any amount. We've got ad-free episodes. We've got some live episodes, side quests. We've got, there. you get access to Discord. There's a bunch of shit on there that we really think you're going to like. And we'd love to see you there. Every tier is a happy tier. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, you hear that, Patreon? <laughs> That's where your fucking slogan needs to be. <laughs> God damn. Every tier is a happy tier. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fucking Bob Ross of Patreon content. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't top that at all. So I would just like to thank everybody very, very much for listening. And we will see you real soon.